Our next session is on attention, timing, and temporal processing. Okay, good. Our first uh, talk in this session is by Jared Leslie, and he'll be speaking on effects of familiarity on musical tempo judgments, a cross-cultural study. So go ahead whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Um, I wanted to start off with a quick outline of what we're going to be covering here today. All right, so I'm going to uh, discuss a study that's been ongoing in our lab that is now my master's thesis, and it is investigating listeners' familiarity and how it is influential to their tempo judgments. Um, we're going to start off with a little bit of background and motivation here, um, followed by the experimental design and methodology as well as um, going into uh, how we broke down cultural familiarity and how we measured tempo judgments. And then going to uh, discuss with you guys a little bit of preliminary data that we've gathered thus far, as well as um, some of the conclusions that we're um, coming to early on in um, starting cross-cultural data collection. All right, so jumping into it here. All right, so. We know there are many similarities in both music and speech, and this conference is a great um, highlight of, uh, of many of those um, par parallels that both music and speech share. Um, today, I wanted to focus on the ability to produce an illusion or an illusory effect, um, also that we like to call them auditory illusions. I was recently reading, um, I recently was able to pick up Diana Deutsch's latest book, um, speech and music illusions, and it was just filled with a multitude of examples of illusions in both music and speech. And um, it was just fascinating seeing all the different uh, similarities that, that are shared between them. And I wanted to uh, talk about a specific illusion here today in speech research known as the gabbling foreigner illusion. And this illusion was first coined by Ann Cutler. Um, those unfamiliar with the gabbling foreigner illusion, it's a uh, suggestion that unfamiliar or foreign language uh, sounds faster than one's native language, regardless of the actual tempo being spoken. While um, early accounts of this illusion were anecdotal, within the past uh, couple of decades, this illusion has received empirical evidence. Um, uh, the first study I wanted to mention was by Fitzinger and Tamashima in which they found German and Japanese listeners overshot each other's uh, native languages by up to 8%. A uh, later study was published by Bosker and Reinisch, which showed a similar effect of language in both German and Dutch listeners, um, looking at implicit um, perception, uh, tempo perception processing in a sentence processing task. And so they they had these, these mutual similarities that there was an effect of language and that an individual's native um, native language was impacting how they were perceiving um, the speed of the foreign language that they heard in both the studies. Now, moving on from this existing evidence, we're interested in seeing if the gabbling foreigner illusion persists in music. Uh, more specifically, if unfamiliar foreign speech is perceived to be faster than native speech, regardless of actual tempo, would culturally familiar music sound faster than um, familiar music? And would this hold true for various cultures? All right, so getting into how we set out to uh, understand this and how we put this together, um, the experimental design we used was we created uh, culturally relevant stimuli. We used music without lyrics that were representative of five different cultures. The cultures that we were interested in investigating were American, Turkish, Latin or Central South American, um, West African, and Indian. Uh, musical genres are complex, and both ethnomusicologists and music cognition researchers alike have trouble on uh, defining exactly what classifies a musical genre for a specific culture. So to assist in our selection of songs for each of the culture's music, we um, actually had reached out and uh, created, we're, we were lucky enough, fortunate enough to create um, collaborative efforts alongside other researchers, uh, the co-authors of the study. Um, and the, in addition to assisting with piloting and data collection, they assisted in stimuli generation and selecting um, audio that were relevant to each of these cultures that were mentioned. Now, after selecting 15 clips for each of the five musical genres, we then standardized them into three different tempo bins, the slow tempo bin being 95 beats per minute, the medium tempo bin being 115 beats per minute, and the fast tempo bin being 140 beats per minute. 
Now, these were standardized using Audacity, using the change tempo function. And we, uh, they were relatively very small distortions. So they were already um, near these uh, tempos. So that we, we try to reduce um, the, we try to reduce any potential effects of distortion. So we used uh, very minimal, um, very minimal changes when adjusting these clips to standardized tempos. All right. So the culture of the two clips, as you guys can see in um, the example trial that uh, participants would encounter in Qualtrics, was they could encounter a trial where they would hear two different clips, where they could be the same culture or different cultures. The stimuli could ha um, have the first clip being slower. The both both the clips could be the exact same speed, or the first clip could be faster. Um, relatively, the same could be said for the second clip. Participants would then progress through 27 trials, and they were given a mandatory practice trial and offered an additional trial upon request. All right, so today I wanted to go through an example trial with everybody here today. Um, this has always been a fun um, example to do with people and it's really fun that we can continue to do it over Zoom. Um, so what I wanna do here is I want to play you guys uh, the first clip and then I'm going to play you the second clip and I want you to, as you're listening, um, relatively think on the scale of one through nine with one being clip one faster, five being the same speed and nine being clip two being faster what you guys would rate these clips. All right, so here's clip one. All right, and clip two. All right. So if you guys want to respond in the chat, you're more than welcome to and say what you guys thought um, what you guys thought it was. Let me try to get the chat up here. All right. Excellent. All right. So very good. The first clip is an Indian clip, and it is actually the, the faster clip of the two. Um, so thank you guys for participating along or if you participated in your heads. Um, if you guys were familiar, I'm curious uh, if, if you guys might have noticed anything different. So I would love an email af after the fact um, if you guys notice any, any illus illusory effect, um, if, those, if either of those clips were familiar to you. All right. Now, um, so how uh, we measured or how we got a measure of speed um, for participants um, in these preliminary analyses, what we're doing is we're implementing a speed rating analysis to demonstrate how participants' rating scores using that same one through nine scale were indicative of their perception of the relative speed of the two clips that they just heard. So what we wanted to do here is, so for this example, I'll show you guys, um, if we, they were listening to an American clip versus a Turkish clip and they provided a rating response of seven, then the American clip would receive a speed rating score of a two, um, given that nine point rating response. And then the Turkish clip would receive a speed rating score of seven. Now, after uh, we were, if we were to go and average these scores um, across all the different trials, we can then take these averages and see what it would be for a specific cultural genre and see um, if the higher the speed rating score, the faster we could say that they're rating these clips. And then the lower the speed rating score, we would say that they're rating the clips as being slower. All right. So thus far, we have 306 participants that have been collected across the world. Um, we've implemented a variety of recruitment methods thus far. Um, a US sample was collected through MTurk, as well as Sona systems. Um, and then uh, our more the cross-cultural side of things, we had uh, collaborative assistance snowballing and running this at first out of their uh, universities, assisting with uh, piloting as well, making sure that um, there were no difficulties with language or um, regional expertise that might uh, be a confound. And so after participants would complete the tempo judgment task, they also were um, given a demographic uh, questionnaire in addition to a cultural familiarity screening, which we'll get to in just a bit and a, um, a compliance check, uh, as well as a headphone measure to make sure um, that they were indeed wearing headphones during the experiment. All right, 
So for the, uh, so the preliminary results of what we found for familiarity ratings is we would ask participants to rate on a scale of one to nine, how much you'd expect to hear this kind of music in your everyday life with one meaning never and nine meaning all the time. And then we uh, came up with a medley of songs for each of the uh, five cultures. And using this medley, we use uh, short uh, two second segments to uh, give, give the participants an understanding of that region's um, musical genre. And I'm just gonna play one for you guys here. And I want you to see if this one's familiar to you all. All right, so I hope uh, that was familiar. As you can see here in the uh, graph to the right, um, I want you guys to pay attention to the dark blue bar um, where we see the British or American stimuli. And you'll notice that across all of the different locations here on the x-axis, you'll see that American music is being rated as highly familiar. And that's no surprise given uh, Western expansion and that you know just Western pop music is very is very popular, and so it's no no surprise that Britney Spears Toxic is known well across the globe, um, but it is it is quite interesting and it actually has created a, a bit of a, some complexity in analyzing the data because everybody's familiar with some of these forms of music, and so we need to. Um, set out further as we continue collecting more um, cross-cultural data and looking for people that might be less familiar with American music or comparing um, other, other variations of musical pairs outside of Western music. Sorry about that. All right. So I want to show you guys, and we're running out of time here, so I want to show you guys really quickly um, the preliminary results from the tempo judgment task. Um, here you can see on the far left, the grand means across all of the different uh, regional locations that we collected from. We do see um, some, some level of robust, I apologize, these are preliminary, very preliminary data. And so um, I don't have error bars here for you guys, but we can see some robust effects of familiarity. And so this is very encouraging and um, we're looking forward to expanding on this. However, back to the familiarity, um, point of things and the fact that we saw that American music was popular across everybody is rather than doing this by geographic location, moving forward with the analyses, we would rather um, look at uh, individuals familiarity based on the cultural familiarity assessment they were given and break their data down by that rather than geographic location and see if we have any um, differences in data and see how uh, the trends might change based on based on that. In addition to um, switching up that the form of analysis there, we also plan on collecting more data outside of um, North American listeners. We want to use some of the exploratory data that we collect and the demographic portion of, of the data, looking at differences such as um, musicianship and um, across ages and language background and ba language background information, as well as possibly implementing a regression model to um, look at trial by trial effects of familiarity. So thank you guys very much. I know we are out of time here. So uh, please let me know if you guys have any additional questions and thank you very much. And a special thank you to our collaborators. Okay, let me try that again. We have about one minute if anyone has a quick question that they would like to ask. Okay, well, I'm guessing all the questions are deep and thoughtful ones then. So if uh, we could um, go ahead and have our next yes, person share her screen. Good, thank you. Okay, our next presentation uh, is by Adriana Lacroix. Uh, auditory attention in persons with aphasia, comparisons of alerting, orienting, and executive control performance using an auditory attention network test. So whenever you're ready. Hi everyone, thank you for having me today. So I'm excited to talk to you about some ongoing work we have looking at auditory attention in people with aphasia and how we're measuring that using an attention network test. Um, importantly, this work is not solely my own, although I'll talk about it in that way, but this is really um, some longstanding work I have collaborating with Corianne Rogalski at ASU. All right, so a little bit of background. Um, so aphasia is a language specific disorder. That's how it's classically defined, but cognitive deficits frequently co-occur. 
And this is really largely because there's a high amount of overlap between the regions of the brain which support language and then also those which support cognition. And so in terms of cognition, we know that people with aphasia who have cognitive deficits in addition to their language deficits have poor um, treatment outcomes. So this type of work is really kind of important and foundational for solving some of their larger issues. Um, and in terms of cognition and specifically attention, uh, much of this work in people with aphasia has really been done in the visual modality. Um, and it's really focused on executive control. So how well are you able to complete goal-directed behavior while inhibiting uh, irrelevant or distracting information? Um, and so this has largely been uh, measured experimentally using the color word Stroop task or the Erickson flanker. Um, and it largely finds that uh, people with aphasia are, have poorer executive control than uh, match controls. But, you know, we really know that attention is really not this homogenous process. And there's several models out there that divide attention into um, more basic components. And here we're going to focus in on uh, Posner and Peterson's attentional subsystems model, which uh, divides attention into three distinct components. So at the highest level of attention, we have that executive control, which is that conflict mitigation, how well you're able to complete that goal-directed behavior while inhibiting uh, distracting information. But we also have two lower levels of attention. Um, so the lowest level would be alerting, which is your initial engagement of attentional resources. Um, you can think about that as how ready are you to perceive a stimulus. And then we also have uh, orienting attention, which is really looking at your ability to select specific information from a given stimulus. And so conveniently, um, you can measure each of these three types of attention using a single uh, task uh, known as the attention network test. Um, so here, uh, participants are told that they'll be completing a uh, flanker executive control task. So they'll see five arrows and they need to determine which direction the center arrow is pointing. Um, before each target, they see one of four uh, cues, either a no cue, where it's just a fixation cross, a double cue, where there's an asterisk above and below the fixation cross. This is the alerting cue. Um, a control for the spatial cue, which is either above or below the fixation cross. And importantly, in our studies, um, the spatial cue um, predicts the location of the target 100% of the time. And so when we run participants with aphasia and a match control group um, through this paradigm, here we're looking at reaction time, we see that there are no differences in terms of um, you know, alerting, orienting, and executive control. Although there definitely is a trend here, but large variability. But when we look at accuracy, we see that they don't differ in terms of executive control or alerting attention, but we do see that the people with aphasia have poor orienting attention. So their ability to orient towards that spatial cue is poorer compared to the control group. And what's interesting here is that this is actually kind of in the unexpected direction. So people with aphasia are actually distracted by the spatial orienting cue um, compared to that center cue. So from this work in um, you know, people with aphasia, we know that they have deficits beyond you know, executive control. And we really need to be looking at multiple aspects of attention with them. Um, and we also need to be thinking about you know, how does this now relate to um, auditory attention? So um, Ed's talk really kind of set some of this stuff up nicely. Um, we know that visual attention is supported by a bilateral frontal parietal network. Um, but sensory modality also affects the neural resources that are supporting attention. And specifically, when we look at auditory attention, we see that additional regions in the left hemisphere, including in the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the parietal lobe, all contribute to auditory attention, but not necessarily visual attention. And so this is really important to when we're thinking about um, attention in people with aphasia, as we know that um, aphasia results from, you know, strokes which affect the frontal, temporal, and parietal, lesion, or, uh, parietal lobes. So it's possible that auditory attention may be more impaired in uh, persons with aphasia than visual attention. And certainly in some of our past work, we've seen that visual attention is uh, minimally impacted compared to uh, controls, which is kind of supported by this uh, neural resources. So as part of this study, we really wanted to know, is auditory attention impacted in aphasia secondary to a left hemisphere stroke? And then how does visual and auditory attention differ in aphasia secondary to a left hemisphere stroke? 
So to answer this question, we recruited 22 people with aphasia, as well as 20 matched controls. And the controls were matched on age, gender, um, education, and hearing status. Um, and then we also got a measure of um, single word comprehension from each uh, group. And this was important as when we talk about the auditory um, task that we use, there is a single word in it. So we wanted to make sure that everyone was above chance on there, especially in that aphasia group, and they are. Um, over here, we're looking at a lesion overlap map of um, our participants with aphasia. So you can see that we have good coverage of the left hemisphere, um, even in this relatively small um, sample size. So to measure auditory attention, we used an auditory um, attention network test. So in this test, um, participants are told that they're gonna be completing an auditory stroop test. So they'll hear the words high, low, or day spoken in either a high pitch voice or in a low pitch voice. And they are told that they need to focus on the pitch of the voice while ignoring the semantic content of the word. So for example, if the word high is spoken in a low pitch voice, the correct response would be low. Now, before each um, target condition, they see or they hear one of um, four cues. So a no cue is our uh, control for the double cue condition. So the double cue is a single white noise burst um, simultaneously to both the left and the right ears. Um, and that's our alerting cue. The center cue is a control for the spatial cue. Um, so that is a correlated white noise burst that's perceived in the center of the head. And then the spatial cue is either a single uh, white noise burst to either the left or to the right ear. And just like in the visual task, um, the uh, auditory spatial cue predicts the location or the ear to which they'll hear the target 100% um, of the time. And this is just generally the procedure that we use. So they would hear a fixation tone followed by the cue, followed by a fixation tone, and then followed by that target. Now this combination of cues and condi uh, target conditions allows us to calculate those three measures of attention using this one task. So we calculate alerting by subtracting the double Q trials from the no Q trials. And here we expect them to be faster and more accurate on those double Q trials. On orienting, we uh, calculate that by subtracting the spatial cued trials from the center Q. And here we expect them to be faster and more accurate on that spatially cued trial. And then executive control is calculated by subtracting congruent trials from incongruent trials. And once um, here, they should be less accurate and slower on those incongruent trials. So when we run participants with aphasia and um, a match control group, through this experiment here, we're looking at reaction time and the controls are the lighter gray. We see that in terms of reaction time, there are no differences between the two groups. They're completing the task um, re at relatively the same uh, speed. Now, when we look at executive, or I'm sorry, uh, accuracy, we um, see that there are differences between the two groups on executive control and uh, spatial orienting attention. So people with aphasia have poor auditory executive control than the control group, and they also have poor auditory um, orienting attention than the control group as well. Um, and once again, on this, um, just like we saw in the visual task, we're seeing that people with aphasia are actually distracted by those auditory spatial cues. So they're slower when they are cued to the ear that the target will be presented to versus when they hear um, that center cue. So from this work, we really see that it's more than just executive control um, in the visual modality that is impaired in people with aphasia. And we additionally see that both auditory executive control and auditory spatial attention are impaired. So how does this compare to visual attention? So here we're comparing um, visual and auditory attention on the two tasks I've discussed. Um, in the same group of people. In terms of reaction time, we don't see any differences between um, the two modalities. But in terms of um, uh, uh, accuracy, we see that people with aphasia have poor auditory um, executive control attention compared to visual executive control. And they also have poor auditory orienting attention compared to um, uh, uh, orient, uh, visual orienting attention. So it seems that um, their auditory attention is actually more impaired than their visual attention. And we think this might be because once again, the uh, regions of the brain which support auditory attention appear to be a little bit more left lateralized than those which um, support uh, visual attention. And you can see in our participants um, here over here, we're looking at a lesion overlap map again, that we really have you know, substantial coverage um, of people having areas 
uh, all of these regions damage, um, which are implicated in auditory attention. Um, and then just kind of some preliminary findings that we have in some of our MRI data, um, looking at the relationship between uh, structural measures of attention, or structural measures in the brain, uh, specifically the left hemispheres, pars opercularis, and uh, uh, orienting attention in this case, we see that participants who have a larger proportion of the left pars opercularis intact um, have better auditory orienting attention abilities. Um, but that we don't see this uh, same relationship between uh, the left pars opercularis and the uh, visual orienting attention, suggesting that um, uh, the auditory attention may be more supported by left hemisphere regions, although certainly more work is needed to be done in this area. Uh, one other thing that I'd like to kind of just bring up is that in terms of the auditory ant, um, we had a difficult time uh, assessing uh, auditory alerting in people with aphasia. Um, and we think that this may kind of be tied to the paradigm. So each trial began with this fixation tone. And so essentially every trial was cued in a lot of ways. And we think that this may have impacted our ability to identify that alerting effect um, in this particular um, uh, experiment. However, we have been doing some follow-up work and we are seeing that um, people with aphasia seem to have deficits in auditory alerting attention as well as when we remove this cue, uh, this effect is still very much reduced. So um, from this work, we really kind of know that auditory executive um, control attention is reduced in persons with aphasia compared to controls, as is auditory spatial orienting attention um, in that participants with aphasia are actually distracted by the auditory spatial cues um, as opposed to having them facilitate it. Um, and that we see that both spatial orienting and executive control attention are poorer in people with aphasia in the auditory modality than in the visual modality. And we think that this is really tied to uh, left hemisphere regions being more implicated in auditory attention. However, you certainly need future work in this area. And kind of pulling this all together, I mean, what does this mean for, you know, people with aphasia moving forward? Well, we really need to be thinking about um, assessing multiple aspects of attention beyond just executive control and also consider the auditory modality because it may be auditory attention that may be related uh, more strongly to their auditory uh, comprehension uh, deficits. And so I'd like to thank my collaborators and funded sources and I'm happy to take some questions. Okay, thank you. And we do have a couple of minutes left for questions. Okay, I think people are probably still thinking about the great amount of data that you provided. We need some time to incubate it before we come up with some good questions. So I'm sure if people have questions, they will put them in the chat or they will email you uh, later with those. No worries, nothing like a clinical population. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay. okay, if we can go ahead and have the uh, third speaker. Yes. yes. Okay, good. Okay, Our, good. Our next talk in this section is by uh, Salil Dewan. My apologies if mispronounced. And uh, the talk will be on the effect of valence priming labels on ratings and neural processing of ambiguous sounds. So whenever you're ready. Hi everyone, my name is Sahil Dewan. Uh, I've worked with Freddie Mino, Michelle Andrews, and my professor, Doc Nealon to make this presentation and this, to analyze the data. And I'm with the University of North Carolina at Asheville and the Department of Psychology. So, this is where it's so our goal of this study, it was an exploratory study to see if valence labels before ambiguous sounds would change perception of sound as measured by ratings in EEG data. And background on this, so we're doing this based on the concept that expectations and context can influence perception. And this was done by a study, and this is uh, influenced by a study about context by Warren 1974 and a visual based study about um, perceiving 
blow up his objects by Alva in 2007. And so this present study will use ratings data of valence and arousal combined with EEG studies to determine how these um, labels affect sounds. But for today's talk, we're just going to talk about the valence ratings instead and the EEG data. So our experiment consisted of having a label appear and then a sound plays and then the EEG records while the subject listens to that sound. And then after that sound plays, we have them rate based on arousal, they see this, or they, and they rate based on that, they see this. And the sounds were chosen by, chosen from the effective, or from the International Effective Digitized Sounds Database, or IADS. And there was 23 of those sounds edited down to between 800 and 1000 milliseconds to create ambiguity of the sounds. And then we combined labels from the effective norms of, for English words database or a new to give those sounds either a positive or a negative label. And then we had a separate group of sounds for neutral labels. So now I'm going to play, and I think the sound should be working on this presentation. I'm going to play an example of three of our um, trials. They're really short, so it won't take too long. So first you see the label, then, it then you hear the sound. And then they're given a keypad to rate from a scale of one to nine for happy or unhappy for valence and calm or aroused for arousal. And this is an example of a negative one. And they're given the same ratings. And here's an example of a neutral one. And so that's, there's nothing really to think about there. So that's why it's neutral. It's just like a, it was sort of like our original control data. And so what happens is uh, for conditions one and two, so we have three conditions. For conditions one and two, we have 14 sounds and they're split up into positive and negative sounds. Or, or they're split up into positive and negative labels. So sounds one through seven for condition 14, for condition one would be positively labeled. Sounds eight through 14 for condition one would be negatively labeled and then 9 through 23 is neutral. Now for condition two, we flip them. So sounds one through seven are negative now. Sounds eight through 14 are positive and sounds nine through, or 15 through 23 are still neutral. And for condition three, we decided to add this later in the study. So this condition is just the sounds playing and then the subject rates them and that'd be it for that condition. And for all three conditions, the sounds are sounds combined with their labels are randomized. So it's not just one full group of positive, then one full group of negative. It's spread out uniformly randomly throughout. And so for our first analysis of our data, we just combined condition one and two and did an ANOVA on the positive, negative, and neutral average values. And so we found that there was a significant difference between positive and negative label ratings, and then a significant difference between negative and neutral ratings, but no difference between positive and neutral label ratings. And we're thinking this may be due to like, um, people expect to hear good sound or negative sounds less than they expect to hear good sounds. So it might've increased their valence for negative sounds. And so we decided that there's a bit of a difference between a big, like a kind of bigger difference between positive and negative than positive, negative and neutral. So we decided to do a new group of ANOVA tests for condition one and condition two versus condition three for no label. And so when we did condition one versus condition three, we found that there was uh, a positive or a significant difference between only for sounds eight through 14 for condition one. So right here for negative and no label. And then for condition two, there was only one significant difference for sounds eight through 14 again, but for this time they're positively labeled. And so we're thinking this may be due to demand characteristics. And we decided to use our EED data to see more of what was going on here. So this is our average ERP across all sounds and all subjects. So condition one and two, it's always sounds one through 14. 
condition three, it sounds one through 14. And for neutral sounds, we have nine through 23, just to see the difference in there. And so for all of our sounds, it doesn't look like there's much going on, but when you compare them based on the conditions, then you see there's a big difference going on. So this is for condition one. And we see there's a much bigger negative peak than there is for any of the other peaks. And for condition two, there's a much bigger positive peak than there is for the other peaks. So we did two factor ANOVAs on condition one versus condition three and condition two versus condition three. So for our first ANOVA on this graph, we saw that there is only a significant difference between negative and no labels. And our marginal estimated marginal mean showed that there was a higher means for sounds eight through 14 again than for the other sounds. And then we did our same ANOVA test on the second graph. So we found that our estimated marginal means were also higher for sound for our uh, group one, which is our negative or our positive labels. I mean, our negative labels. And this time, our negative labels were also, oh, I'm sorry, our positive labels were rated higher in our estimated marginal means for our two factor ANOVA on our third graph right here. So that kind of goes back to what we were saying that there might be some big effect between sounds eight through 14 in comparison to the rest of the sounds. And so here's our peak differences for P, uh, N1, P2, and P300. And you can see there's also that big peak going on here, that big peak going on up here for our positive values. And then when you compare that to our ratings data, you can see there's something going on here. So when you look at just sounds eight through 14, they're actually rated pretty high. Like the negative sounds are in red and they're rated pretty high compared to positive. So something about our sounds makes them, makes our subjects not want to rate them negatively while sounds one through seven are rated negatively consistently. And then for eight through 14, again, they're rated much higher than negative. So something about those sounds is causing this big difference in our data. And so this is a bit of an exploratory study. So we're not sure like we see, we need to do more analyzing on the waveform and getting more subjects. And so our original conditions, we only have we can only play our sounds once for each subject because when you have a study like this, you can only play the sounds once because you're expecting the subject to be surprised when they hear it. So they can't hear it again or the ratings data won't mean anything much. And so we can only play each sound once. That created only 84 epochs for condition one, 91 epochs for condition two, and 77 for condition three. So hopefully after this um, virus goes away, we can get more data, and more subjects, and get some better answers about what's going on here. And we also need to analyze our waveforms and see what's going on with sounds eight through 14 that made them so different than the rest of our sounds that we tested with. And the next thing is we could possibly try analyzing from different electrodes. So I don't know if you can see my video, but CZ is like around here in the center of the head and the top. So maybe we could try some different electrodes on the top of the head to figure out if we can get some better data from that. And um, that's, pretty much it. Here's from our references. And thanks so much for doc to Dr. Nealon and Freddie Mino. And uh, I could not have done this presentation without you guys' help. And I guess now I have time for questions. Yes, we have four minutes remaining. So there's ample time for some questions. Uh, where's the chat? What is for the previous speaker? Okay, there's a question from uh, Mike Russell. Can you explain why you think different electrodes will make a difference? So we just like use CZ as our main electrode. We're thinking maybe we could compare and contrast different electrodes to see if they produce any different data because of like the magnetic fields that are produced um, from the EAG, from the um, different spots in the brain. So maybe different areas of the electrodes could have different information, like maybe there's some temporal artifacts or something like that going on. 
diagnosis. Okay, there's a longer uh, from Jake Patton. I'm not totally sure this is a question, but a hypothesis on why your ratings are wonky. That's a technical term. Uh, the negative stimuli sounded very much like a sound effect, something that might be used in a horror movie or a haunted house commercial. And these could elicit positive feelings. Similarly, the positive stimuli could be a little artificial. That's a, that's a good idea. I didn't think about that. That's something I'm going to look into in the future. Yeah, and also something else, actually, that I to mention. So in our waveforms, you can see that laughter and sad and winter and torture, these are two of our um, condition, our sounds one through seven. So this one's actually very, very high. Like It's got very high amplitude. This one's very small, but somehow they both produce those big eight through seven or four, eight through 14 sounds. Uh -huh. uh, Michael Hall says, somewhat related to Jake's point, I appreciate that you haven't looked at waveforms yet, but descriptively, is there anything in the sounds as a listener that you think might be responsible for why some weren't rated positively slash negatively? I think some of the sounds might be either too not crisp enough or maybe like just too dull or too quiet. And that could be a reason why. So they're not having as much of an effect on the listener and possibly they're not as startling as we expected them to be when we first chose them. Uh -huh. So I guess following up on that, loudness or amplitude should be a critical parameter in your results then. What was it? Uh, Potentially. Well, are these the same questions twice or? Wait. Well, what did you say? I was reading the question. Oh, uh, no, I was, I was just following up on your response to Michael Hall. Oh, oh um, sorry, what did you say? That's fine. Yeah, I just spoke instead of typed it. <laughs> um, what I was thinking was basically that suggests that the, the amplitude then or the loudness is actually a critical part of the response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or so for the clock, critical part, yeah. So for the clock, I think that's, let's see. The clock is one of the neutral sounds. That may be one of the rated rated lower ones because uh, that's a pretty quiet sound, pretty fast sound. But then for laughter and sad, uh, I don't have it on this graph, but in our Excel data, that one's much higher than some of the other ones because it's a little bit of a thicker graph at a thicker amplitude. So something we're gonna probably focus on next. Okay, we still have about a minute or so if anyone else has a question. Okay, well, I'm sure uh, questions will probably occur as soon as we log off here and move on to the next presentation. <laughs> so right. um, if the next speaker could go ahead and start the screen share. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, and our last talk in this section will be by Leah Fostick, and she'll be talking about temple summation for young and older adults. So whenever you're ready, Leah. Yes, so thank you very much and uh, good night, everybody. It's almost 10 p.m. here in Israel. Thank you for participating uh, and, uh, and thank you, thank the organizing, uh, organizer for, uh, for this meeting. Um, I will describe here a study we did about temporal summation among uh, young and older, older adults. Thresholds of auditory nerve fibers and auditory neurons are commonly specified in terms of sound pressure level. However, they are dependent on time domain. The sound pressure required for detect detection decreases uh, with increasing stimulus, stimulus duration, suggesting that the auditory system integrates sound over time. You can see in this demonstration by Gelfand that the intensity required for detecting a sound decrease, uh, 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 decreases with increasing sound duration. Moreover, the changes in intensity and duration are proportional. Indeed, studies show, and this is an example from a study by Watson and Gengel, that the detection thresholds decrease with increasing sound duration meaning that the intensity required decreases when the signal has more time. 
also, as you can see in the different lines in this figure, when the frequency is higher, less intensity and time are required. So there is an integration of intensity, frequency, and time. When we consider breath by cues, this age-related decrease in hearing ability, we often talk about an increase in hearing thresholds, especially for high-frequency tones. Here you can see a typical audiogram for females on the left side and male on the right side across different age groups, which are represented by different lines. On the x-axis, you can see different frequencies from as low as 250 hertz to as high as 8 kilohertz. And in the y-axis, you can see the intensity required relative to what is considered normal hearing. Hearing threshold between 0 and 20 decibels show good hearing. Threshold of 30, 40 and above show a decrease in hearing ability. So you can see clearly that with advancing age, there is a decrease in hearing ability, which is pronounced mainly in high frequencies. However, aging adults also have difficulty in the time domain. They integrate temporal information slower than young adults and therefore require stimuli to be slower and longer. In the study of the late, left side of the slide, you can see results of a gap detection task carried out by Heinrich and Schneider. On the y-axis, there is the gap size required for identifying correctly which sound has a gap. On the x-axis, you can see the results for different frequencies and marker duration. There are group differences for all conditions, but they are more pronounced when the marker is short, 10 millisecond, when it is longer, 20 millisecond. You can also see it in the left side, for the, uh, in the right side, um, for, for a duration discrimination task, aging adults need longer JNDs than young adults at short tones duration, but at longer tone duration, the JNDs are smaller. So in the present study, we aim to compare older and young adults on temporal summation, focusing on the effect of intensity, frequency, and time. In terms of intensity, we predicted that older adults would have higher detection thresholds than, than young adults and would require higher intensity in order to hear the sounds. In terms of frequency, we predicted that for young adults, detection threshold will be lower for higher frequency but older adults will have higher detection thresholds for higher frequency. In terms of time, we predicted that the older adults' slope will be milder. If aging adults have difficulty in temporal processing, they will not gain from temporal summation. So no improvement with stimulus duration is expected. No improvement in, in thresholds uh, is expected with, with stimulus duration. We had... Uh, um, 20 young participants and 15 aging adults. Uh, we took all the participants had, had relatively good hearing, although aging adults had a higher hearing thresholds, which are characteristic for their age. They did a sound detection task for one and four kilohertz in several sound durations. Okay. So you can see here the detection threshold by tone duration for high and low frequencies for older and young adults. And uh, uh, on the right side, uh, you can see the same result when tone duration is presented in logs. You can see that as expected, older, older adults needed higher intensity than young adults for both frequencies. This reflects the difference between age groups in hearing ability. Temporal summation is evident for both age groups, mostly up to 100 milliseconds. For young adults, there is no difference between 1 and 4 kilohertz. This is contrary to our expectations. While for older adults, detection threshold and temporal summation are different between these frequencies. Let's look into the results. Here are the results for only for 1 kilohertz. For both age groups, there is difference in detection threshold between all duration up to 100 milliseconds. The difference between the mean thresholds of the two groups um, is 8 decibel. Now, on the right side, you can see the older adults' thresholds 
compensated for this difference. The lines are combined almost fully, suggesting that the age difference are almost fully due to the difference in the peripheral hearing ability. Here are the results for the four kilohertz. The young participants show the same picture as in one kilohertz. There is a significant decrease in detection threshold with the increase of sound duration up to 100 milliseconds. However, here the older adult slope is much milder with temporal summation occurring up to only 50 milliseconds. It can be seen more clearly on the right side when the older adult thresholds are compensated for the 21 decibel mil difference from the young. The lines are clearly different. You can see it here, one against the other with the values of the slopes. The slope of one kilohertz is similar for both age group, while the slope of four kilohertz is significantly milder for, adult, for older adults. Here you can see correlation between hearing thresholds at 200 milliseconds that represent hearing ability of the individuals and the slope for one and four uh, kilohertz. The correlation for one kilohertz for both age group are around 0.3 to 0.4 and are not significant. Also for the young adults at four kilohertz. However, for aging adults at four kilohertz, the correlation is 0.8. This means that the hearing level predicts temporal summation for all the adults at high frequency, but does not predict it in the lower frequency. So to wrap up, it seems from our data, the time had similar effect on both age groups and contrary to our expectation, all the results difficult in temporal processing did not affect their temporal summation as long as they could hear the sound properly. Their performance with 9 kilohertz was similar to that of young adults in terms of time, while the high frequency that was difficult to hear, more difficult than, than the 1 kilohertz, the difference in tone duration almost did nothing. So temporal summation reflects the ability to sum energy over time. Aging adult loses temporal summation in high frequency, but not on lower. Is it because larger loss is on high frequencies? So it's related to the, to the hearing loss and as bigger the hearing loss, uh, 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 you, you lose, with big, bigger hearing loss, you lose the temporal summation. Are there other additional or additional factors that affect temporal summation in more aging adults? Where can we draw the line between yes or no temporal summation and this is not only for older adults, but to all kinds of hearing disabilities. Um, when, which disability or which hearing difficulty will affect temporal summation and, and which won't? Thank you very much. Okay, and we have uh, about five minutes left for questions, so ample time if anyone has questions. If it was in Israel, I would say that people are tired at 10 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't have this excuse. <laughs> well, I think here we might have the excuse of uh, uh, needing siesta after lunch, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, it might also be taking people a while to, to type uh, things. Right. Okay, yes, there is a question from Michael Hall. If not high frequency hearing loss, then what might it be? You see, we, we know that they have um, a, um, a difficulty in temporal processing, but this should have affect both. But um, the fact that they also had difficulty in hearing, um, um, decrease in hearing uh, ability in one kilohertz and, and still did uh, have temporal summation, 
So this is something, um, I mean, losing the ability to hear high frequency affects more than the ability to hear. It affects also the temporal integration. So it, it might be um, um, the, the high frequency hearing loss, but we need to consider that in this frequency, the loss is um, so robust that it also affects the temporal qualities, the temporal abilities. Okay, uh, I have a question that's a bit out of left field or a bit highly tangential. If we're looking at issues in temporal summation, I wonder how that might be related to temporal averaging, because we know in some types of uh, visual illusions, at least, temporal averaging is thought to play a role in um, the flashlight effect, for example. Temporal averaging is one of the main kind of explanations for why that illusion occurs. So, so given that as background, then might there be some element of maybe averaging going on in addition to or instead of or complementary to summation? I need you to elaborate a bit about the temporal averaging so I can I'm answer so, it. I'm sorry, say again, please. I, I will need you to elaborate a bit about temporal averaging so I can answer it. Oh, okay. So for example, in um, the flashlight effect, which I, which I mentioned in that question, uh, in that effect, typically a stationary flash that is aligned with moving object is perceived to be behind the spatial position of that object, not aligned with it. It's perceived, in other words, to kind of lag behind the object, hence flash lag. And one of the explanations is that the processing where the moving object is takes an average of temporal positions over time. And that average, uh, if it starts at the time when the flashed object is shown and, and stops when there's uh, conscious awareness of that object, then that average position is gonna be shifted forward Okay, right. so the, the averaging over those triple slices causes the illusion. So I'm kind of wondering if we get effects of averaging and that kind of illusory effect, how that might relate to um, just summing of temporal information. And I did warn you, it was kind of a left field peripheral question. <laughs> right, no, I, 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 <laughs> it's interesting to combine it into the, into this, I, I'm thinking about our method that um, we, we gave the participants um, the sounds uh, with different durations, but, but in blocks. I mean, they got um, either all kinds of duration for one kilohertz and then all the duration for four kilohertz, and it was oh. called counterbalance between participants. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't so mixed. And we also gave them um, the duration gradually. I mean, either you uh, start with the shorter one or mm -hmm. with the longer one, but it, it doesn't, we didn't fully uh, intermix it in, in order not to um, uh, confuse the mm -hmm. participants. Right. So it, it might, it might that. Uh, it might be that there is something about the averaging because um, the duration um, increased or decreased gradually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something I think that I might have to ponder a bit more before I can state it more uh, concisely. Uh, you see, there is um, one question from Mike Russell that will ask, uh, OA and YA are similar at one kilohertz, but not at four kilohertz. What do you expect to be the case for sounds greater than four kilohertz and sounds between one and four kilohertz? I, I mean, we, we need to, to remember that they, they weren't exactly the same. They had the same pattern. I mean, uh, all the results uh, needed um, 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 higher intensity. But the pattern for temporal processing was, uh, for temporal summation was, uh, was the same. Um, for frequencies higher than four kilohertz, I, I, I expect the same or even milder a uh, slope than we got in four kilohertz. Between one and four, this is the question I wrote in the end, where is the line? I mean, and what, what does it depend on? I mean, does it depend on 
the, the individual's hearing threshold, or does it something that more, is more characteristics uh, with the, um, the kind of hearing disability or hearing difficulty? Um, so, so we have conducting hearing loss, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's older age, but we have all, all kinds of hearing difficulties and hearing deficits that can be characterized uh, differently and the line can be drawn at uh, in different places. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, thank you. And we're out of time for this session. So this concludes the uh, attention, timing, and temporal processing talks. Um, we'll have a 30 minute break and then we'll come back for the final session on auditory scene uh, analysis, which will be followed immediately by a brief business meeting. And I would like to say that everyone is invited to the business meeting. So feel free to stay for that after the next session. So now uh, enjoy your 30 minute coffee break and see everyone again soon. <laughs>